it was like magic. Because once I pulled them, got out of the car, and, and the roar of that crowd, the people was, I mean, I never seen a crowd like the people at Rucker. The court was so crowded that you couldn't see the end line. You come in the park, people hanging all on the fence and everything, and they had the bleachers, and people like all around you. I mean, this venue right here, Rucker Park, which is the greatest era in the world of street basketball, the greatest players in the game played right at Rucker Park. It's the essence of how street basketball reaching its ultimate peak. You learn how to play in the playground, and you took it to a high level. Rucker is God's design, not man's design. Rucker is a place that, that God designed to expose greatness. He was the leading scorer. He's the only guy I know that made $25,000 a year and bought a Rolls Royce. I mean, we said those guys, their baskets must be 12 feet high because they come down and, and play against us. They're jumping up over the rim. People came to show their talent. If you was a one-dimensional player, you couldn't even play in Rutgers. The crowd would embarrass you. There was no escape or nothing. You did it or you got it done to you. The park was on 155th Street and 8th Avenue. You could be down like 146, 47, you hear the roar of the crowd. Arr, arr. Philadelphia is the mecca of of basketball, and that's where it started. I mean, that's what you know, we claim. But New York has a lot to say about some of the great, greatest playgrounds that they have down there. Our basketball is second to none. You know, New York think they're better than us, and we think we're better than them. And that's how it is, and that's how it's always going to be. In our time, sports, most of it was a recreational thing with no intent. Like now, you can take your son and say, hey, you play basketball, and you're six foot five, and you're 10 years old, we're going to get made. We played in Ruck and it was sometimes 95 degrees, 101, 102. You know what it is to play 48 minutes? And when the game was over, all Peary Curtin would think about it. I just wish they could tap it again right now. Don't let us rest, don't sit down, don't do nothing. Just throw the ball back up and let the party and the dance begin. Yeah. Man. Hey, Jazzo, oh, this is the blockbuster joint, my nigga. From. You'll be so overwhelmed by how pretty it seems. New York, New York, big city of dreams. Where rap music was born and took it right to the top. The capital of the world, homie, like it or not. So, start spreading the news. Even with the towers down, we here, don't get it confused. The city that never sleeps, we wide awoke. We can't burn in the club, dog, hide your smoke. Most women from New York dress good and walk mean. Bad bitches from Fordham Road to Fort Green. Manhattan and Queens. I ride through Shaolin Island, blasting that cream and go casuals, everything around me. New York, get the money, dollar, dollar bill, y'all. Hallelujah, New York, where I was born and raised, and that's Basketball was invented in 1891 at the School for Christian Workers, now Springfield College, in Springfield, Massachusetts. It was early December, and Luther Gulick, chair of the physical education department, asked one of his staff to invent a new game something the school's athletes could play indoors. That instructor was James Naismith. Naismith grabbed a soccer ball, and the school janitor found two peach baskets. They fashioned each basket onto the gymnasium's opposing balconies to serve as goals. Next, Naismith summoned 18 athletes, chose captains for two teams of nine players, and outlined 13 rules. As the whistle blew, they started playing the new game of basketball. James Nason said, here's the ball, there's the basket. Put the ball in the basket, look how simple that was. Then he put five guys on the floor from each team, put a coach up there and messed up the whole game, basically.
Don Sperling, the great, great, great Don Sperling. Yeah, the great, the former, the <laughs> former great. Basketball, to me, is the purest form of sport because it's such a, it's a simple game, yet, yet it can be a complex game. It's a team game, but it's an individual game. Other sports are harder to play. You got to get. You can't play football with one person. You can't play baseball with one person. You can play basketball with one person. It's one little kid standing on the court, looking up at the basket, and shooting all night. It's four players playing two on two. It's ten players playing five on five. It's a team game, but yet it has individual expression. It's simple. It's one ball. There's a romance, okay, to basketball that's very special in this country. It's a very romantic sport in the sense that. It's played on the asphalt and the streets and the cages in New York, but yet it's played in the back barns of Indiana. It's played in the Midwest, the West, the South, the Northeast. NBA started in 1949. Now the reason that league was started was that there was nothing back East much that filled the hockey arenas when the hockey teams were away on the road. So owners wanted to bring pro basketball in to get more attendance, to make more money on the venue. At that time, uh, blacks was, wasn't really interested in basketball, but uh, I, as a young man, a couple of us started playing up the schoolyard, and we played with uh, and learned the game realistically from uh, some older white players who had been playing all along. Uh, most of us played a lot of baseball because basketball hadn't become a popular sport at that, that particular time for African Americans because up until 1950, there were no African-Americans in the National Basketball Association. I mean, some of the greatest players in basketball, in our opinion, uh, never made it to the NBA, never had a chance to. In our time, sports, most of it was a recreational thing with no intent like now. You're gonna take your son and say, hey, you play basketball and you're six foot five and you're 10 years old, we're gonna get millions. The recreation center where I actually grew up playing basketball for a period of years, we were denied entrance into the inner interior of the, of the recreation center. Sometimes we play on the outside, and we get the, the big uh, trash cans and light a fire. And you're shooting and you're rubbing your hands, and you're shooting and you're dribbling and rubbing your hands. The professional basketball players, like I said, many many of them in the initial stages of the game could not stay in the same housing areas with the uh, with their white counterparts on the team and um, uh, until this was broken down it was uh, uh, it, it's kind of rough kind of very difficult for uh, the players and if this nigga think he can tear the niggas up I'll go also inform him that the white men can be stayed up to defend what is rightfully in the 50s you know, African-American people didn't have a lot, but you know, we had, we had a, uh, a culture connection, man. We had a culture connection. We felt each other's pain, man. Because years ago, we played with our heart, with our guts. We gave our life to prove who we was on the basketball court. And now, youngsters today are taking advantage of that and not putting themselves in the position to reap the benefits that come from our labor. Young people need to just draw from the reality of the past, man, to understand that we got to get it back. What, what basketball has done is transcended civil rights. Well, um, my senior year, they integrated the high schools. When the basketball season started, I was the only black on the team. And the first three or four games of the season, I wasn't able to play because uh, they were afraid to take me to, to the game, away games because the Ku Klux Klan had sent a letter, uh, contacted the school, and said, "Don't bring those that in to our, to our, you know, to our town." We couldn't go down the main street. We had to go and try a different direction, because only because of the color of our skin. I actually remember seeing uh, signs that would say, uh, "And when you got to North Carolina, welcome to Klan Country." Uh, big billboards. You know, they paid for it. They put it up, and it was there. So you're asking a guy not only to, to, to deal with his real personal life and his real life, but compete with those kind of things on his mind. That's what makes you an excellent athlete. You're able to lay that aside and gig. Do your gig. Get it done. So the New Yorkers come into this game with a record of straight victories at home. But the fabulous Olympians, Cinderella team of the NBA. You know, my experiences with segregation in basketball are plentiful. Um, there are times when uh, 
You know, I've been called spook, nigga. Um, things that just didn't make any sense. I mean, you had so many things going on, whether it was politically, socially. Uh, and I think we, uh, as African Americans, found a little sanctuary in playing basketball, going to uh, the different playgrounds. That was kind of our world to, to, to forget about politics and religions and what's going on in the society. I mean, guys used to sit in foxholes in Vietnam. They wasn't thinking about dying. They were sitting in foxholes talking about moves that Pee Wee Kirkland made and Joe Hammond made and Tiny Archibald coming out of court tricking people and Will and Cream Abdul Jabbar. But, but, but the game was, was a haven for escaping. You know, you'd have your few hours in which you escape. And I'm sure players were thinking both ways. And they put all that aside and then speak the universal language, which is, you know, let's get out here. And let's get this sweating and get the, you know, strutting our stuff and getting the, you know, trying to do something in the moment. So therefore, when you got up on a, on a basketball court in any one of these ghettos, especially Harlem, it, it gave you an identity that our society at that particular time in the 60s and the early 70s wasn't willing to give Afro-American people. We got our identity from street basketball, from playing right in the street, from challenging the greatest players in the NBA. They would come from NBA teams all over the country, right here at Rucker, to play against the greatest street basketball players in turns out today in the world. Rucker was like the place. Like, like guys want to come to Magic Square Garden to play. Rucker was the place to play. And the people were saying how hard it was to play up there, how hard it was to get on the team up there. So I used to just start going every day. You know, when Rucker started one year, I went every day, every day, trying to get on the team. Nobody wouldn't put me on the team. I didn't get discouraged, though. First year went by. I, I just ended up, I was like a fan watching the games. Next year, same thing. Third year came, came up there and the guy pushed for sale from the West Side. Says, um, you want to play? I said, do I want to play? I said, can I play? He said, sure, he threw me a shirt. They were sorry. Everybody in Holland was sorry. <laughs> they said, yo, we see this guy come to games all the time. You know, we didn't think this guy can play. This was my first game I scored, 63. To me, to, to me, there was nobody better in that era. That's, the, that's my opinion. Fly was a natural guard at 6'5". He offensively, very few peers. That's Queen, baby. That's Queen, baby. Not bad. That's Queen, baby. What you talking about? That's Queen, baby. Did Joe Hammond ever come back to the box? No, he was trying to leave because that stuff started hitting on him. But, but, but he was high. He was just a guy before he got there. As we started talking, I kept looking at him. It started coming on him. How beautiful is a tree? You know what I'm saying? It's like. That's beautiful. That was Joe Hammond, man. Joe Hammond was, was that good. Joe Hammond was great. Joe Hammond was ahead of his time, man. Joe Hammond. Joe Hammond, you know what I mean? Yeah, great player out of New York, Joe Hammond. There it is. A lot of people say, why was Joe Hammond a great shooter? Joe shot 500 jump shots in the morning, 500 jump shots in the afternoon, 500 jump shots at night. When other kids went to school, Joe was on the court shooting jump shots. He knew her angles on that backboard. I never seen nobody understand the angle. Joe take two steps across that half court line to shoot on the backboard. Who could envision that? He knew the auction angles on the backboard like people do playing pool. Of course, he was always a legend. Going back in my time when I was coaching at St. John's, people would talk about this Joe Hammond, you know. No matter who you brought from the NBA, he could pick up five kids and beat you. You wasn't going in Wagner, and you wasn't going up, uptown and beating Joe. Simple as that. You go out and you get dominated by somebody that you've never heard of. Hammond. Hammond who? 
Well, Mr. Hammond, I call Joe Hammond now. If he drove down and you were open, he'd find you. If he drove down and maybe they double teamed, he was able to hit the free man. He could do other things than just put the ball in the basket. Played for the people. Played for his people. I thought we were going up fifth. We are, but I got to go on 25th. I see I got to go on 25th. Right, well, we'll go One on one, forget about it. He would undress you. And by that I mean he could just, you know, fake you right out of your, your shorts. Uh, he could go to the hoop. But more important, not only could he go to the hoop, he would finish the play. If you didn't go for it, he'd go back again and come back, shoot the backboard on you. Or if you go for it, then he'd go to the basket. Who are you going to compare him with? I mean, that's another thing. Who's going to compare him with Chamberlain? You're going to compare him with, with Frazier? You're going to compare him with a Jerry West, Oscar Robinson? Where are we going there? I'm going to a uh, check cashing place. Joe was one of the greatest, greatest guys that I've ever seen put on a pair of sneakers. And that's with the, that's with the Dr. J's, and that's with the uh, Michael Jordans, and everybody else. Just what happened? Nah, oh, man, I wanted to go to the check cashing place, man. I told her the fucking place is closed at 3 o'clock. Spending my money, honey, oh, I... Oh, shit, man. He was a, a complete player and could make the play, which is important. Some guys only can do things for themselves. They can do things for others, and that's what puts you in a separate place. Popping good bottles of Chris, champagne and wine. Pee Wee Kirtland was a, was a great influence on Joe, but on the court, um, Pee Wee made sure to put Joe on his team to be a winner, because I, I don't think that Pee Wee wanted to compete against Joe like that, you know, especially the way the record was going back then. Pee Wee Kirkland, Pee Wee Kirkland was probably one of the best point guards to ever come out of New York. Joe, greatest games, I was on the court. Joe told me that. He said the greatest games I played in my life was on the court with you, Pee Wee. We was like magic. I mean, Joe could throw me the ball and, 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 and be running around, pick, we play a game. I take the ball like I'm throwing you and do that there. And Joe would alley oop the ball. Because we knew what, you know, players, when you know it from the neck up, you know what players are going to do. Pee Wee could turn down money because he had money. Joe had a little money, but he was more of a street hustler, gambler, dice, or whatever. But, um, you know, he couldn't compete with Pee Wee when it came to finances. A lot of people waited to Rucker to see what kind of car Pee Wee Kirkland was showing up with. All the front, like four or five cars in Rucker, the spaces were being held till I got there. People wanted to see what kind of cars I would get out of. They wanted to see how many women would be in each car. They wanted to see what kind of clothes Pee Wee Kirkland had on. When he rolled up in the Rolls Royce, that's like one of the most famous stories ever. When he came here late? Yeah. And had the girls folding his clothes? Yeah, folding his clothes and all that. All that. Put it out. Yeah, Pee Wee, Pee Wee's a legend, man. An absolute <laughs> legend. Back then, what I wore, everybody wore. And that's in clothes, the jewelry I had, everybody had, the cars I bought, everybody bought. I, that made me an official trendsetter. I mean, a lot of times we hear about the, you know, the Nate Archie balls. Uh, but Pee Wee was probably one of the, he's another the playground legend who uh, could have been very successful in the NBA or ABA. Uh, I'm in awe of the fact that I'm out here playing. You know, I see uh, Connie Hawkins. Uh, a helicopter, and Joe Hammond, and you know these guys are driving up in you know, limos with furs and rings and you know hats and their entourages and people are taking their clothes off and they come out on the floor and <laughs> put on a show. I really, I love the furs. I had any kind of fur you can imagine. They said I had to wear so many furs I look like a pimp. But it was just a New York style. You gotta have style to be in New York. When I got the rucker, it was like. The, it, the stage was set. I remember being at Rucker, and, and, and girls that I was with had towels, and under the towels they had sawed off shotguns. I mean, it was real the way Pee Wee Kirkland lived, because I lived a double life. So when I left Rucker, I went to another world, the, the world of crime, the world of, 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 of survival. It wasn't about basketball. Well, it was people that were caught up in the drug world. It was people that were in uh, to other kinds of illegal activities. There was just things that were going on that were obvious 
you know, if you were there at the time, uh, you just knew that certain players weren't going to make it to the next level. I'd come to Rucker, have to stand up all night long, and still have to score 30, 40 points. But when I got to Rucker, for that moment and that time in my life, I was able to forget the life of crime. I was able to forget the streets. I was able to forget the drug game. I was able to forget everything. For that particular time in my life, it was like magic. When you have an urban town like New York, it didn't matter what ethnic group. I mean, it was the it was the Jews and the Irish and the Italians in the 20s and the 30s that were, you know, playing in the urban centers and were barnstorming and playing all around the country and were the stars of the of those days. And then African American players started to really focus and play a lot of basketball, and it became an expression. And especially when the 60s happened, and there was a lot of and there was a lot of expression in music and culture, basketball became one another outlet for our artistic grace and artistic excellence. Street basketball is the greatest phenomenon in any sport right now today because it was the best kept secret for years. Playground basketball is so recognized, it, it's almost an implication in New York. It wasn't corporate, it was real, man. And, 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 and it's something I love, man. I wouldn't be alive today if it don't be with street basketball. That's how guys saw it back then. It was in your blood, you felt it, it was in your spirit. It wasn't just a paycheck. It was for real, man. It was in your heart and in your soul. And that's the essence of street basketball, man. You learn how to play in the playground, and you took it to a high level. When you walked on as a little kid, you know, first you were just watching. Then you got the nerve you want to try to ask to play, right? And they tell you, no, you go down there and play on the third quarter over with the bent rims, or the one with the net that we just tore off. You can't play with us. And then one day, somebody doesn't show up. They go, all right, man, come on, slap him. Come on, play with us today. But, you know, you... Make sure you handle yourself correctly, which means pass us the rock. You know, play defense, don't get us in trouble. And if you take a shot, you better make it. And there's great players at all, Houston and Seattle and L.A. and Chicago and Atlanta and Florida, everywhere. But in New York, that's really the home of playground basketball. No one really kind of walked around the country with books and said, this is how you run a playground. But that's how every playground ran. You could visit, you could go from one city to the next and go play, and that was the rules, you know. And you would always try to find out where the best playgrounds were, where the best competition was, so you could see what you had. But there's nothing like, you know, having it happen live, and there was nothing more live than this park uh, back in the 70s. We used, we used to be smaller than that coming out here watching these games. That's what we talking about. That's right. Crazy. Rucker fans are nuts. Please. Oh, please, they're crazy. I mean, you, you, you cross them out, you, you do something back then, please, you would hear it, and it make you want to do something else. You know, and that's just how it was. You, you make a move or you go to the cup and you drop something on somebody and they bang it. I mean, it, it just makes you feel good. We was all up on the rules, all up on his rules, all in the trees. That's before, they, we used to be on the fence, they used to say, please get off the fence, the fence is gonna fall. You just bumping into somebody. Because people just, because they ain't gonna see no line. They couldn't help themselves. If you look up here to the roof, this whole roof used to be crowded. The whole land, people up on the roof. You have three, four thousand people hanging on the fences. You couldn't believe. You couldn't get in there. It was crowded. Guys hanging all over the place. Sunday afternoon, that was the place. Because there was no TV, don't forget. There was very little TV. During the summer, we do Sunday. Let's go. Let's go to the Rucker the game. Then there were the neighborhood games. Then there were night games. There were games all over the place. I mean, first start playing against Monroe and them in Rucker. I ain't Kareem and them. The first play of the game, I come out the corner on Kareem and threw it down, hit the back of the backboard and came out. That's how we was taught. It didn't make no difference how big the big man was. All I wanted is a half a step, man. Uh, you know, the, the fans. They came to see and they were concerned about who won or who lost. But lots of times, even in defeat, if somebody put on a pretty good show, they could walk off the court and win. I would just, the crowd would just take me there. I remember one time I was on a fast break and, and, and I was fixing to throw it down, but my mind was so obsessed with the crowd and wanting to rock the crowd, I ended up going behind the pole, come back to the foul line, just re, re rocking again and went. And when I went to the basket, instead of laying it up, I flipped the ball like this here under my arm like that. There, a guy named Larry Cheetah grabbed it, hit it on the backboard twice, and then dunked it. The crowd stood up. 
That's what I'm saying about Rucker. It's a such thing as Showtime, but we took Showtime to another time. Hey, we champions, y'all. Where was you? I balled up at Rucker. You know, you said, where was you? I balled up at Rucker. That's it, just to say you balled there. You know, and the next thing they're gonna ask you, well, who was you balling against? You know, it don't matter. I was up at Rucker Ball, and that's what I said. I mean, this venue right here, Rucker Park, which is the greatest era in the world of street basketball, the greatest players in the game played right at Rucker Park. It's the essence of how street basketball reaching its ultimate peak in terms of being national, international. It was like a, a domino effect. You know, like one hit the other and the other. And before you know it, it's cross country and everybody want to play against so everybody, man. You know, it didn't get to be like it started with just a, a game. You better be there. You ain't, you ain't nobody. saturated with the history, the spoken word of guys who would come from the streets, who played in the neighborhood, who played against the guys who are now the NBA top 50, guys who are now in the Hall of Fame. It, it, the, the history is rich because it's confirmed. I go all over the country speaking to young kids, and I don't know no place I go anywhere in the country that people don't remind me of certain moves that happened at Rucker and certain games that they would never forget. And all these things are recorded in the back of their minds. It's not like the NBA. It's not like the ABA. It's not like any other professional reality. Street basketball is, is, is a, a street thing. People remember you in their hearts. They die because they love you. They love the, the, the highlights that you place inside their minds that otherwise might not never exist. On my left, from the Boston Celtics, Tiny Archibald, the all-star guard. And Tiny, I know you've played here, you've seen a lot of ball here. What can we expect to see in this game today? Sal, I played many years here, and I think the, most of the summer leagues, uh, you see a, a lot of freelancing, outstanding moves, going to the basket, a lot of dunking. I, I would say more freelancing because it's not a, a, a coaching situation where guys get into it. You have uh, more freedom to do what you want, especially the guys that have you know, really played in the in professional sport. Why Williams? A well-known summer basketball player. Fly Williams, my goodness. Fly Williams and I played against each other quite a bit. We played against each other a lot in the CBA. Um, probably one of the most talented players ever played in New York. Fly Williams with the ball. Here's Williams down the lane with a layup, and that was very nice, un practically uncontested. He was the leading scorer. He's the only guy I know that made $25,000 a year and bought a Rolls Royce. Fly probably had more talent than anybody I've ever seen play basketball. And I don't say that about many players, trust me, because I'm talented myself. But Fly Williams was like, it was just something about him. He could just do everything. And um, <laughs> the boy had just unbelievable talent. Un unbelievable talent. Pass inside was deflected out of bounds, so it remains the west side of the ball. How I love the morning under the west west sun. Flowing on the best to wake up in your chest and pack a vest for fun. Young guns out here in the heat. Back to what? Back to finish the game. It ain't wow. done. Young hustler, finish the game. It ain't right. done. Play a partner, finish the game. It ain't done. Young gangster. Trench coat in the funk. Red beam with a red eye. Lead tint in your frame. Head siege when it heat seat. Rim reap with the pain. Whole head tense up since cut. Mess around, stink off in the blood spots when the heat's walking. I was with the sixes. So when I got put on waivers, they said, where you going? I said, I'm going home. They said, home? Where's home? I said, Brazzaville. I just came on back home. Played in the Continental League, went to Alaska. Played in Lancaster. Uh, played in Rochester. Gave a play when I was 28. Dude. I just stopped. Went in the streets. I became a typical kid from the hood at a late age. I was the guy that, 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 that didn't believe shit stink until it actually hit me in the face. The police used to bet when I was gonna get killed. You know, they just say, you know, the precincts, they betting. Wonder where we gonna find them dead at. 
They told me I was one of the smartest guys they ever came after the police when they got me. They said, how did you avoid us so long, so long? I remember one day they changed me from East New York to Brownsville. I was in, uh, I got into four different cars. They flying this way, I'm going by them this way, just as slow as this regular car. You know, the police fly, woom, 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 woom. I'm sitting there and, and, and laughing at myself. I wonder who they chasing. Sometimes I ain't have a gun and do this and the police should be diving and I take off. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know? I mean, I used to bluff the shit out of them a, a lot of times, you know? But I mean, because it, it, I never, I knew I had so much against me that, that, that I really didn't want to get caught with that gun again because I never came home. The Rucker games seem more exciting to me than even NBA or ABA games. They show their appreciation. He was ahead of his time in the NBA. But up here in Rucker, he never made a layup. He dunked everything. Everything he dunked. And that's why they start calling him the Surgeon General, because he was operating on people's shots. Operate. It's like you lay it up, he say, you know what? I think I'll perform a biopsy. I tell you, man, I got famous. So him dunking on me. <laughs> now you should try to mimic Doc. I had the big head. Now you should try to do moves that Doc used to do. That's how I made the Knicks. Doing the moves with Doc. I seen Doc doing the playground. Well, Julius Irving, you know, sort of snuck up on a lot of people. You know, he. He didn't really grow up in New York City. He didn't play for one of the great New York City high schools. He played out in Long Island. So it was Julius, for a long time, was a, was a good, well-kept secret. But what happened was Julius eventually wandered over to Manhattan and started playing in the Rocker tournament. I had signed a contract to be a pro. So I started uh, barnstorming before the beginning of the, uh, my first pro season with the Virginia Squires. And uh, we put a team from the, sponsored by the Daily News, New York Daily News, uh, to come and play, play in this park and play in the leagues. You know, I loved it right away. I mean, it was, you know, it was so different from, um, you know, my basketball experience up to that point. And uh, it was the first time I experienced where two points was actually worth more than two points. You know, uh, two, per, two points might have been worth uh, a dinner, a date. Uh... Word started getting out that there's a kid that is the successor to Connie Hawkins. And Connie Hawkins was legendary here for the types of moves. I mean, the things Connie Hawkins was doing, people hadn't seen or thought they would ever see again. Well, anyway, you know, rookie camp, everybody trying to impress each other. Dr. J came down the middle, jumped from the foul line, okay? And we, you know, all the guys, veterans, we sitting there watching, oh, what, what, what's this guy doing, man? Who do you think he is? Jump from the foul line. So he put that arm up, and you know his bush was flying, and every, all the big guys went up to block the shot. Man, Doc went and dunked on all three of the big guys who was back there. And everybody just fell. Doc fell. Everybody, you know, you know, the big collision, man. And we, all the veterans, you know, man, don't you see that? So Albie Yankee blew the whistle. He said, Tom, he said, Doc, man, go take a shower. We don't want you to get hurt. Just come back to veteran camp. The pep talk that I used to give our guys, they're New Yorkers playing basketball guys. I still hate them. And let's go out here and beat the hell out of them tonight. And it works. <laughs> You're protecting your home turf. Philadelphia is the mecca of, of basketball, and that's where it started. I mean, that's what you know, we claim. But New York has a lot to say. Listen, there's a lot of money betting against Philadelphia. That's one thing about Philadelphia, New York. We're serious about our basketball. Our basketball is second to none. You know, New York think they're better than us, and we think we're better than them. And that's how it is, and that's how it's always going to be. Listen to this, guys. I know you're going to love this. I don't remember ever losing a game in New York. And I played a year, for years against New York from high school on up. After I started going up there, they learned to hate me. You know, and I, here I am a teenager, but they wanted to know, was I coming? Yes, I'm coming up there, and we're going to beat the sugar out of here again. Yes, I am. That's what I'm here for. What the Rucker was to New York, the Baker League was to Philadelphia. We as young adults did not have anywhere to play. 
against our peers. So we started the Baker League. Then out of that grew the Sunny Hill League. And uh, I'm very proud of being one of the original members. Probably threw up the first shot in the Baker League. Uh, they always say that about me. Charles Baker, who was uh, responsible for uh, having the recreation centers opened up so that African-American youngsters could, uh, uh, we could go inside and use the facility. Um, <clears throat> And, of course, the, the Baker League is named after him, and that's how uh, uh, it really got started. Here in Philadelphia, a man who was the co-founder of the Baker League, as we bring you Baker League basketball, and it's been a great tradition, Sonny. Well, the Baker League has a great history behind it. I guess the best way to look at it is look at some of the great names that have played in this league. When we first started in 1960, Wilt Chamberlain, Woody Salisbury, Guy Rogers. Then as the years went on, Hal Greer, Chet Walker, Earl Monroe, Billy Cunningham, Bill Bradley, Jeff Petrie. It just goes on and on. We were the team to beat in Philly, man. They used to stand outside McGonagall Hall. They didn't see a New York tag. They didn't go inside. But was one thing they could not do. It stopped the shot. See, they play old-fashioned basketball, give and go. Well, we came up there with the dribbling and then shooting long shots. They were not used to that. We said in New York, all the players in New York can really jump. I mean, we said those guys, their baskets must be 12 feet high because they come down and, and play against us. They're jumping up over the rim. They could all jump. That's where jumping started in New York. And New York will always have these guys like 5'6", five, 5'7", five, dunking the basketball over their head trying to intimidate you before the game. And that's, that's just how they were. I mean, they had the jumping his brothers I ever seen. I have never seen anybody like Jackie Jackson jump. He jumped on top of the backboard all but God damn, where's this guy here? Okay, guy, let's keep going. Beat the heck out of him. He'd jump up this high, shoot under him. He'd stay down, shoot over him. Wind up with 50 points on him. It doesn't make any difference. We didn't have any official refs back there, so we used to, had a couple young guys that we broke in, and we used to pass the hat around yeah. to get money for the, for the referee, so they can buy their wine and stuff yeah. after the game was after over. Game Never was over. before. After. You before. had to keep them sober until the game was over. Hey man, who's that cat coming down the street? I don't know, but it sounds to me like that's just the man with the bone. Sure having himself a ball. was they were ambassadors, okay, and they would call them Gopher. They had never been to all of them were from Chicago. Ultimately, they became, after going through hell, became the Arab Goodwill ambassadors all over the world. And they didn't do it with a gun, and they didn't do it with money. They did it with So the Globetrotters were a very integral part of the success of not only the BAA, but also the NBA. Well, I've been coaching him for two years now, and I marvel at just watching him play. Is it basketball? Yes. Will the still? White folks made that name. White folks made that name up. That ain't him. These guys know. He know him at dip. He know him at dip. He know him at dip. Him. Him. They don't know. They don't even call him Will. They Talking about a man here to play the whole game. Did what he wanted to do on the court. When Shaq or those guys would be sitting down, Will would still be gigging. No one can do what he did. No one on the planet a best man. He's a great athlete. I saw him pick up 500 pounds. I almost dropped off a roof watching him and Johnny Samuel. And he picked, I fainted. I put off the roof. A guy picked up 500 pounds, man. Oh, hey, man. Hey, listen. He not only run track. He not only run track. Just remember now, whether he win or not, he's getting ready to fight Muhammad Ali for the World Heavyweight Championship. I don't know if he's going to beat him, but he's going to fight him. I have in my possession a signed contract for him to fight Muhammad Ali. I mean, that was actually going to happen. I'd accept your challenge as soon as I finish with a few more contenders if I beat them. Well, then I can't get your signature on the line, but I 
Just hold your pen. Don't rush things. How long? <laughs> how long? Just, just quit pop, don't, don't start popping off. I'm not popping, but I like to know how long. When you start popping off, you'd be in trouble, man. I'm gonna take it easy with you. Just be cool. But you can't tell me how long, though, can you? A man can only wait so long. The Kansas City Chiefs drafted him for tight end. I don't know what he's gonna play. They talking about he's gonna break his legs. I don't know about all that. But they, but now he threatened the NBA after his first year. The average. The top player in the NBA averaged 21 or 22 points. Rook came in. Dips averaged 35. That's 13 different than the rest. So then he threatened him and told me he's going to quit. He's going to be at the captain. He, he got that money together. Put some more on. Put some I'm going to lead the league in scoring. He did it because he felt like whatever he wanted to do, he did. But the most dominant force, the strongest man to ever play the game. Anytime that you can get 55 rebounds, I mean, score 100 points. Paul Hazard used to work, work, huff, puff, and shoot, jump, and then dip with touch it at the end. When I first came in and saw Will, I was like, I guess. 13 or 14 myself at the time. He wasn't in the game. Okay. And everybody told me, hey, did you see that guy over there? See how tall he is? No. And then they put him in the game, he got up. Ah, you know, the smallest guy I seen was mad out. You know, he's 6'10". Well, this guy's 14 taller than him. Ah, boy. But I also saw what was up. <laughs> when the guy that we just, now I told you who was playing against an old Northeast guy named Jim Parker, Jim Parker. who was all public, 6'5". He there. was all this yeah. and that. And Wilt was 14 every time Jim Parker turned him Smack down, it down. And throw. Oh, God. <laughs> he had the time in the 14. Yeah, yeah. Man, oh man. When I see him, like I said, I walked through the gates of the center, man, and I looked up and saw this tall. Look at that guy, man. And they got it on that day, yes. man. Oh, here comes this guy. Oh my God. Right, you got a mouth for almighty. Right. Mouth for almighty. Right. With him. <laughs> there you go. Why you Where's get this? my brother? What's that, man? What are you doing? <laughs> I don't getting? want nothing. I'm, I'm with him. <laughs> What's that, man? How you doing, man? Good, how you That's doing? That's right. Man? Get us all. We ball players. <laughs> See the Rucker shirt? Get it all. <laughs> Bro, get the Rucker joint. <laughs> you give him the numbers, too. <laughs> Why you get, get it all, right, Joe? Oh, man. You got you to gotta mouth now. Destroyer. You ever see Joe play? Yeah, yes, I have. When you see him play? Back in the early 70s. Was he the truth? He was the he was the destroyer. <laughs> I, I watched him hit hit 50 on dot. In a half. Left out in halftime. He left. Some people say it didn't happen, some people say it did. What do you say? It, it did happen. Someone came in here at halftime, supposedly, and dropped 50 points from halftime to the end of the game on uh, Mr. Urban. And yeah, to this yeah. day, we still don't know how accurate that story is. Well, let me say this here. If anybody in the world had ever scored 50 points in street basketball, in the NBA, or anybody else on Mr. Irvin, there would be no Mr. Irvin. Nobody's scoring 50 points on, on Dr. J. What it was, they always talk about Pee Wee, right? But they were always doubling up on Joe. That's why Pee Wee would score. See, it has nothing to do with Joe being great or not being great. Because if you take that game with Irvin out of the equation, you, Joe still will be one of the greatest players ever played basketball in the NBA, ABA, WABA, and on the planet Earth. And the greatest pure shooter I've ever seen in my life. So Joe's still going to be that. Who was a better ball player, Pee Wee Kirkland or Joe Hammond? Joe Hammond was the legend. He's the legend out of Harlem. Everybody know it. <laughs> Joe scored about, I think, the, I know the exact number. I brought the ball on, 46. He came just before halftime. Joe played a phenomenal game. I remember Joe telling me, Pew, I can't shoot no more. Man, my arm tired. I said, Joe, I'll take you to the hospital when it's over. You got to keep shooting, baby. So I remember that game clear as day. But the streets twisted around and said he scored that many points on Irvin. Well, Joe scored almost 50, but Irvin wasn't guarding him. And you can't say you scored 50 on a guy that's not guarding you. For the record, Nobody scoring 50 on Dr. J. Not the Dr. J we know up at Rucker, man. It wasn't going to happen, man. For 
before I could play, I used to stand right on those rocks and duck down and throw pebbles on this court here. And then they said, get that little yellow guy. Every time he come off the mountains, the rock stop. He's the one throwing them, you know? And an old man named Eddie, Eddie Parker, he said, Joe, I'm gonna give you something to throw, because I know you the guy throwing rocks. He said, I ain't gonna beat your ass. Here, here's a pair of dice and a basketball. He said, no, nah, you can't play. You wanna throw something, throw these dice. Joe was in high school and he was playing with the pros. And Joe was at good 35, 40, man. He's, when I came to New York, they said, this guy Joe Hammond. I said, who is this guy Joe Hammond? That's all I get was Joe Hammond, Joe Hammond. You know, and then when I saw him, I said, how you doing, Mr. Hammond? Joe was great. Joe was a great player, man. When the Knicks signed me, they wanted to sign Joe Hammond at the same time. I said, let's see if we can sign this fella. And I can remember sitting at the table after a nice plate of pasta. And I said, look, Joe, I would like to offer you a contract. Three years, no cut, starting at 35, 40, and 45, which in those days back in 70 was a nice contract, guaranteed. And we had a lot of discussion back and forth. And the thing that astounded me was that he said to me, I can do better the way I'm doing now. He was very, very amicable. You know? But I guess it wasn't enough. He could have done better. Maybe he felt he was tied down. And maybe he couldn't pursue his other interests. Well, Joe tried to act like Pee Wee. You know, yo, you got to give me this amount of money, or this and that. And they was like, nah. But if he had took that little money that they was going to give him, he would have been a multi-millionaire now. And he would have been, he would have been listed as an NBA, one of the greatest players in the NBA. That type of talent, he would have done very well. You know he would have fit in. You know he would have done well. You know he would have carried his own bag. I remember we used to go play in the Eastern League, right? We would ride around all day looking for Joe, and we would find Joe in Mount Mars Park shooting crap. He said, Joe, let's go, man. You're going to go play? He said, when? He said, see this? Joe have a handful of money. He said, I'll see you next week. And Joe was making, like, I think at the time, Joe might have been making, like, $150 a game in the Eastern League. And we played two games in a week. That's $600. He was turning down. But I don't know how many. He might have had about 2000 in his hand. I was making $90 a game. I went and got my $90. I was happy to get that. People know talent that's in their, that's in their veins. And they know about them. They see this guy. Wow. And they, it grows and builds up. They said, you got to see this guy. Because the big thing is, on the weekends, especially during the summertime up there, you have a lot of college players, a lot of pro players. They would play. And they say, here's a guy that didn't go to college and didn't play pro ball. And here he is, he's holding his own and doing better. And taking the big guys on and, and doing quite well. So he becomes a legend. And people say, wow, can you imagine if this guy only did this? Wow, can you imagine if he only did that? He got involved with some stuff and he never you know, reach his potential, I guess. Things just came a little too easy for Joe. The game of basketball came so easy to Joe until he couldn't really take the full advantage of it. It was so easy for him. It's bittersweet. I could have been a contender. There's the old best life. <laughs> Even though he was It was never full of I don't say no grace, nothing. My girl get on me about that, you know what I tell her? When I was in the penitentiary, you bend your head down, you wouldn't say some grace. You may not get up. When you go from one extreme to the other, you find yourself going to the pr a maximum security prison instead of Chicago Bulls, then you sit there and, and night after night, for me it was almost 14,000 nights just thinking about street basketball and, and giving up that opportunity, losing that opportunity, and, and what it meant to be a real role model, because you don't know what it means to be a real role model when you come out your house and all you're thinking about is being alive when it's time to come back in the house later. You don't know what it is to be a role model when nobody have nothing but the drug dealers, the pimps, the players, the max, the guys playing the shot. Ain't nobody but hustlers had anything in them days, and when you saw that, 
then you glorify that and that's what you want to identify with. And that's what Peter Kirkland want to identify with. And that's what caused Peter Kirkland to go to prison and set it to the NBA. I was in the roughing chair with the attic. That's hell. The jail 40 feet in the ground, the wall 80 feet high. The birds don't fly over, they fly around. Them. I tell you, I first got in there, got off the bus, they found out I was a professional basketball player before. Police knocked me out. Straight like that. Used to be somebody. I wake up, I'm in the firm. Try playing with 15 years with no parole like I did in prison. Tell me about that release. That's a good, big release, you know what I'm saying? Gym, the gym and the court never meant more. Probably get 10 years of pissing on the sidewalk now. You know, but my record is like that. I mean, I got, I got uh, eight felony convictions, man. The reality was my life was about the street, man. And you got them gangsters in Chicago, L.A., and Virginia, and Detroit, and, and Harlem, and everywhere, depending on Pee Wee Kirkland. Myself? Um, guess me, seen a, seen a devil, you know, when I got shot. You know, because uh, when I got shot, I died. I had a little pulse, they brought me back. I got shot several times, I can tell you that once. I got shot one, two, three, four different occasions. You know, um, well, the shotgun blast in my back give me hell on some days like today. Some days it's better than the other. You know, um, in my leg, I didn't even know I was shot. I was so scared running that um, I didn't know I was shot until I got home. You know, because uh, it was a shootout, and, and I just got out the mix, started running, and once I got home, I found out I was shot. You know, I just got the bullet removed out of my face, you know, a couple weeks ago. I would tell any kid, you know, you want to learn from Peary Kirkland and be the Peary Kirkland I am today. You want to be the Peary Kirkland I was back then, man. You understand what I'm saying? The most difficult for me getting locked up was they fed me what they wanted to feed me. They counted me like cattle. And you had to protect yourself every day. Because all the money in the world, all the jewelry in the world, all the homes with the elevators and, and everything. Guess what, man, when you're in prison, none of that means nothing. None of that has any kind of value. Your life, your, who you are, your substance, your child needs to know that daddy's going to be home. Um, miss your loved ones. Holidays, birthdays, kill you. Kill you, man. I mean, there have been times where I knew Christmas was coming, a birthday coming. I go to the box. It wasn't about no NBA for Pee Wee Kirk. When I stopped playing the rock, I went to prison and the pros stopped playing because they put something in their contract saying if they get hurt, they're not responsible no more. So I wasn't gonna play if they had stopped playing anyway because I wanted to kill the pros, man. I wanted to prove that guys could come out the hood, you know what I mean, and not go to the, all these sophisticated colleges and bust the pros ass. When they came to get me, I was living right here on Ralph Avenue, right around the corner here. When they came to get me, when they came to get me, you just thought they came after John Gotti. When they got me, I was kind of glad they got me, man. I got tired, man, running, man. You know, um, you don't have to have nothing. But every day you wake up, you got 1,700 other people in the jail with attitudes. Didn't want to be there. Didn't accept what he did to be there. I love the life, and I'm never going to stop loving the people in it. But it took me 40 years to get out of it. Guys write books and bits and bits and pieces of everybody get their little bits and crumbles and you know, in the hell with Joe, you know. Well, I don't want that.
People have counted me out time and time again in life. They even had it one time I was dead, you know? But I also look back now and see to myself that I was put here for a reason. You know? The reason is, uh, to me is that I got the passion on one of these kids. And I'm gonna do that. Because they may not want it, but they definitely need it. Now, why you, why are you 1,000 now? What is that? That's what we agree on. I'm not giving him more before. But that's just for this agreement. Agreement of that? Of this. But I'm giving him more. I'm giving him two money orders for 500 dollars Why would uh why would he just um take it out? Take this out. Joe Hammond wasn't just a uh, uh well as they say, just a uh ordinary legend. Joe Hammond was another era of the basketball. Something that, like, once in a lifetime you'll see a Michael Jordan, once in a lifetime you see the Magic Johnson. Well, Joe Hammond was another era of basketball, like that. Not just uh, another player or another draft. Joe Hammond is still here, and the whole story is yet to be told. I mean, it'll take two movies to do the whole Joe Hammond story, at least two. A great player out of New York, Joe Hammond. Got involved with some stuff and he never uh, you know, reached his potential, I guess. And he was up against the same thing a lot of other young blacks were up against. They weren't really interested. Good player. the intro so everybody from here on in will understand that you cannot be a legend because you want to be a legend legends play against legends you have to earn that not be given that just don't become a street legend because you played one good game. You become a street legend after you stop playing basketball. If somebody call you a legend and you're on the court playing, then you know you're tied up in the corporate America. I, it was 30 years after Pee Wee Kirkland stopped playing that I actually heard the word legend. And that's what street basketball is. When you know you've earned that right to be called that because you've played against the greatest of the greats. See, it was a golden era. And it'll never be that again. You know, I just kids me. It's good that we're doing this so they can hear about it, you know, and know about it, because what, what's going through their heads now, I can see it. It's not the type of basketball that's going to breed a better basketball. Our youngsters, they didn't get them mixed up. They think it's about a trick or fooling somebody. Well, if you lose the game, the only person you fooled is yourself. If you can't score or play basic basketball and don't know fundamentals, the only person you fooled is yourself, because you never reached the epitome of the sport, and that's the NBA. How you going to be an NBA player? and all you got is tricks. It ain't never gonna happen. A lot of the circuits of basketball is hurting the game. You know, what I'm saying it's hurting the game. These kids is picking it up. When they go to the next level, they won't make it. You see a lot of kids in the, in the game right now, you know, they can't shoot, they disrupt the flow of the game because they haven't been taught the proper fundamentals. Why isn't somebody in the NBA really using the most power, one of the most powerful weapons ever besides dunking? A hook shot. 
a Skyler. Why aren't they going to Kareem saying, look, there's a hundred guys in America that are seven feet tall. Can you please show them how to shoot a hook shot? These guys are straining just to dunk. When you look at and one, and the kids traveling all over the country with your tricks. Do I like it? Sure, I like it. Because I'd rather see kids traveling around the country doing tricks than selling dope. I'd rather see them doing that than being hit men. I'd rather see them because that's an opportunity for them to at least get exposure in the free world than to be going to commissary or wearing a numb in prison. I think a lot of guys come to the park and they just want to bust one move. That's what and then they done. I was telling them that too. Dude you know what I mean? That, that's the only part I dislike about when I watch playground basketball right. today, where you know you're trying to play to 11, 15, whatever, whatever, and after something happens on the court, the game is over. If you couldn't make showtime work in prime time, then your showtime had to wait to use up 20 or 30. But I, with me, I it had me. I wanted to, I wanted my showtime to be part of prime time. So when I faked you, it had to be two points at the end of that from my assist. It wasn't no, like today, you cross somebody over, you break their leg, they fall down, you go to basket, somebody slap your shot over the fence and they still <laughs> clapping because you because you rock somebody. Back then it was the finish. Now today, they give you credit for the beginning of the play instead of the end of the play. Today, they can shake a guy across over and miss it, and the game over. And they running out the stands. I mean, what's the object? Running out the stands, man. Oh, 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 start drinking Kool-Aid, man. Oh, well, man. I mean, they're going crazy. They got to stop the that? game and pause the game. He done did something and yeah. missed the shot, some and they did, go crazy. Something did get lost a lot. Right? A whole lot of things got lost. It needs to be recaptured. You're supposed to want to learn fundamentals and basics, and and be and, and to be a pro, you have to be a master at certain one element, at least, of the sport. We had the Globetrotters, who was getting paid money. Now we running around playing Globetrotter, getting paid hardly nothing. Sad case scenario, man. The real art of ball handling, not this and one stuff, and that's all good. Now, the circus is always good, and you know, you gotta have that, and that's good. But the real craft of handling the rock so you can penetrate to break down five on five and make it five on four to draw the traffic to you like Jason Kidd can do and dish. You know, more kids should be able to do that. You know, shouldn't be, he shouldn't be the only one doing that. There's a lot of guys, but they're not taught that. It's got to be passed on to you. I mean, years ago, the edge we had was we had coaches that taught the game that was excellent coaches, that gave it to us on a superior level. But when we think in terms of kids today, kids today, nobody's teaching no kids the game from the neck up. Joe makes the best point because he says a lot of guys don't know what their game is. I mean, there's always been guys on the outside looking in. There's always been guys on the inside. And you know, it's a thin line between the guys on the inside who are playing, who are getting paid, and the guys who are on the outside. But knowing your game and knowing your strengths and weaks is going to give you a chance. Well, we used to come to play. We just study a guy. You know, we did a little homework before the, before the game. You know, we knew the strong point. Leaving it the chance. Yeah. That's what, you know, today they just come. You know, and don't put no effort in knowing about the guy that play. There's no way I'm letting a guy come down to the same thing to me twice. Twice in the game. <laughs> and it but was an embarrassment. He got to do it eight to ten times in the game on. It was an embarrassment <laughs> level. Anything that you let him get away with, you didn't feel that you had to say, help made it happen. You felt to the person. Personally, something weak about me. He did that to me. You know, and, and, and that made you train hard, you thought hard. Like you say too, Brad, you said you study the guy hard. You know what yeah. I mean? You watch any game, there's one guy on every team that can make the game unbelievably exciting at every moment. You watch Orlando, you got McGrady, you watch Kobe, you know, you watch Allen Iverson, you watch Stephon Marbury. Every team has somebody. But it, there has been an evolution in the sport and the, the quickness with which things happen. Sometimes I just sit there and I watch, and I watch it and I admire it. Because, yeah, I because that's reality. That's the reality that you know we all have to deal with because because we played we played all in the same era and there were some guys before us. You know, I guess in the mid '70s that kind of changed. They got universal machines. I think I think it started happening when they started letting a lot of stuff go so they could keep the game moving. They, right. they, they've always been dickering with it, trying to find a way to keep the continuity, keep the game flowing, keep it to the freelance style that you see out here. Exactly. That you see out here. I mean, they wanted to really be the game that's played out here. Let's go back to the 50s or you know, early 60s. 
It was hard for guys like you because of your style to be accepted in the NBA. Is that a true or false statement? Because, that's true. And that's how come the ABA was kind of created to have the freedom to play and had the freedom to express yourself on the court. Okay. Is, is, that a, is that a wrong statement? Is it a wrong assessment? No, it, it, it's correct. I mean, the, the, the NBA, it was a, a, a patrol environment. You know what I mean? You did something that wasn't basic, even though you threw it around your back and threw your legs and hit the guy, he's made it, they take you out and sit you down. You know, oh, yeah. if you just drop it down low and now the ABA, I loved it, the ABA, 150 wins. Doc tell you we had a ball. You know what I mean? Uh, you had the freedom to express yourself. Yeah. Like you had uh, announcers in NBA games trying to knock street basketball, saying, well, that's street basketball. Well, they only playing street basketball. Well, that's all ABA was doing, but that didn't stop the NBA from buying them. And then the NBA had to figure something out beside a pick and roll and, 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 and give and go because ain't nobody paying two and three thousand now to see nobody do a pick and roll give and go. Uh huh, uh huh, yeah. Right here, baby. Right here, baby. Uh huh, uh huh, yeah. My favorite basketball player, Rocket, is when I make a hot sauce. Man. Why, why, how come hot sauce? Because he be shaking and baking. My favorite basketball on Ruckus is um, Steve Francis when he dunked it from the foul line. Go ahead. My favorite basketball player is um, on Ruckus part is Steve Francis. How come? Because the same thing he said. Because he dunked it from the foul line. True. My favorite player on Ruckus Park is hot sauce. All the courses he's doing, nobody can't stop him. My, my favorite player from Ruckus is Allen Iverson because they be blocking people, making them fall. Breaking ankles. Seeing you too, man. Are you Kobe Fox? Yep. You ain't Joe Jelly Bean, right? Yes, I am. And you? Travis. Travis. What's your name? Yeah. Jay Van. Jay Van? What's up, man? What's your name? Oh, yeah, that's the name. Jelly Bean. That is him. What's up, man? You alright? What's your name? Anthony. Anthony, you lost your skin? You lost your skin? Still cross you over. Not me. Get it twisted now. I, I, I bust Kobe old man. Shh. I dunk on Kobe. I took Kobe on his movie. Keep dreaming. Now. Keep dreaming. There are only 356 slots in the NBA at this point in time. And 56 of them, 56 additional slots, were lost last year to the European player. It's probably over 3,000 seniors that play basketball just in the United States every year. There's only two rounds of drafts. I I hate what they're doing as far as taking kids out of high school. I don't care who you are. If you're waving 65 or 75 million dollars in front of a kid, he's got to take it. So why are they doing that? They can't tell me that. Uh, I don't mean to talk about LeBron James uh, because he he, he getting 90 million dollars. I'm saying why not let this kid go through college and understand how it is to maintain himself, how to, to understand how life is. They wave $65 million, and if you, if you do that to me, back when I was in Fremont High School, I would have left. But I would have suffered down the road. We want to stop the suffering and stop the pain. So that means out of 3,000 seniors, only 60 guys get drafted. Woo! 3,000? Two rounds of draft, that means 60 players. I'm not even talking about the foreigner players now, the players overseas. 3,060. Now, out of those 60, probably only 30 make it. You want to be a pro baller one day? Yeah. How long have you been playing basketball? One year. One year? You can drill pretty good for one year playing basketball, my man. Thanks. What do you think it takes to be an NBA, an NBA player? I'll be back. It takes your life. About school. What about school? We're good. Contracts today are commonplace in the millions. You know, rookies start out as millionaires now. All these million of dollars that you're making, you ain't coming back in the hood making a difference in nobody's life, man. You know what I mean? And, 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 and the kids are tired of seeing you talk about how much money you got. And you ain't giving nobody the money, ain't helping nobody. I mean, you're downtown a restaurant spending $120,000 on Chris Style and Champagne trying to impress white folks. 
when these kids right here in urban America need you because they need opportunities, man. They don't need them on MTV. They need them right here in the hood where they live at. They need ways to get out the hood besides selling drugs or getting caught up into the things they get caught up into. There's so much money being made in there by the owners, and uh, I think that they should get as much as they can. I mean, hey, they're making plenty of money. You know, if, if, if the NBA get three billion for putting it on CBS, watching these guys get some money. I also think some of the guys that go to college should get some money. Because the NCAA make a lot of money. And they want these kids to stay for I mean, hey, I'm coming there with one shirt uh, and a pair of pants. I'm playing for you. The school's making money, you know what I mean? You take the school like Notre Dame is on every week on TV with all that, but they make money. You know, the kind of money that guys are, are, are getting paid now, you couldn't be but happy. I don't have nothing against giving money to, to, to colleges. Why are you going to give money to colleges before you give money to people that grew up in the same neighborhood, in the same building, in the same project you come from? That's insane, man. You, that's a corporate move. You don't know where that money going. You give some of these kids in urban America a chance to go to Division One schools, a chance to go to Harvard, Yale, or Princeton. They, they got the, the ability. They just don't have the resources. That's why God gave you the opportunity and the gift of basketball or whatever it is is your genius to make that much money so you can turn around and help everyone else. Not so you can keep and stand up in your little ivory tower and look down at everybody like ha ha ha. That's why if you keep ha 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 you deserve to be Humpty Dumpty. You know what I mean? But if you reach back nobody's gonna mess with you. Back in the day, we didn't have the out any contract and no cut as right. kids have now. Yeah, you I mean, you talk about Nintendo, PlayStation, all the computer games. Yeah. I mean, back in the day, we had three TV channels, three, six, and ten. Maybe yes. had uh, a couple of UHF yeah. channels. Right. But that was it. This was probably a more major outlet for us yeah. than, than it is for the day's outlet. Because the sport has evolved, it's more popular. <clears throat> I think if you go back to 1970, and you want to say, OK, who are the world's greatest players? You might get to a list of 100, 200 players, and they would really be the cream of the crop in the elite. Now that number's expanding. There might be five or 600 people in that pool that you have to draw from. When the pros come up here now, they kill these guys up in Rucker. You see it? They treat them like man children. It's hard for me to watch. It's almost like somebody reversed history in the back of my mind. I can't believe I'm watching it. Because the rucker I know, the kids in the street was killing the pros. Now the pros come up here and they think it's funny. They call it what? Entertainment. Man, that's not entertainment, man. You understand know what I'm saying? You're taking away the principles and the glorification and the reality of basketball. It's this here. Somebody killing me cannot look funny to my girlfriend sitting here. It can't look funny to my family watching. How the hell that's entertainment? That's not entertainment. It's only entertainment if I'm the entertainer. Yeah. If I'm killing you, it's entertainment. You killing me, it ain't entertainment. I'm ready to fight. The criteria of greatness is weakening every day right in front of us as a people. In the NBA now, you can actually have three and four turnovers a game and be in the NBA All-Star on an All-Star team. To me, that's ludicrous. When I played in college, I got two turnovers all year long, and I remember both turnovers. That's 40 years ago. Probably the level of talented basketball players globally has definitely increased. The Chinese basketball players, they're soldiers, you know, and in Europe, you know, they're, they're organized a lot earlier. We, we have done it, and our, our legacy is about it happening even though we weren't organized to do that, to fulfill our destiny. We had to, we had to find our destiny. You know, we had to go find the game. The greats played against the greats. And you know how you can really tell it? Because most of the guys who are street ball legends, the ones that I know that went to the NBA, they got the statistics. They either in the top 50 or in the Hall of Fame. You can't be a street ball legend and then go to the NBA and don't do work and don't do your job and don't kill them. Because if you're a street ball legend, the criteria for you is, is higher. It's bigger than the NBA, it's bigger than the ABA. If you're a street ball legend, that means you will kill everybody from maybe the grade school up. You will hold every record in high school, break every record in college. You will, if you playing in Rucker, you will hold records in Rucker. And if you get to the pros, you're gonna embarrass the pros. That's a street ball legend. That's having legendary status. It's not a joke. That's something you have to earn. It does nothing to do with corporate America. You did that because your heart. You did that because you played with your heart. You did that because 
basketball meant everything in the world to you. Over to the game was over. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a tip it off with Fly Williams and Will Chamberlain. Cody like Stone's talk, made you want to go home. But I'm going to tell you about it. Your heart like Moses I scored 63 points out here on an outdoor court. That was a wreck. I never heard that. I let others. I'm a king like that. Tiny Dart Jabal. Keep me turf and no receiver. Something good to remember. Kareem Abdul changed his name from Blue House Center. Home in the helicopter. He was always flying. I'm looking out the window watching oh, Tilly be crying. There were the whole bitch on the kid Harris. Way down there. Way down there. And he's still here. Yeah. Like the yeah. 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 So Oscar Robinson and Wally Jones, let's go. This is all I know and I ain't giving it up. I'm going down in history and living it up. I'm praying to the basketball gods for the energy. I'm living for the legacy that we're giving to me. This is all I know and I ain't giving it up. Hey, bro, I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you, where Kobe at? Where Kobe at? I can throw that out of you to see. At last, somebody done did it. Passed me the rock so I could get sick with it. The asphalt gods is here. They gave me handles of the year from the way I dribble a spear. At the park every day, developing a set shot. Never had a dad to play ground with my step pops. Get mad and take your ball home, we got another. The street lights is on, you getting called by your mother. What the true meaning of big fans is see if you can get past my triangle defense. Cross over a break, both the 